Speakers, publishers, consultants, coaches, and info marketers unite. The Speaking of Wealth Show is your roadmap to success and significance. Learn the latest tools, technologies, and tactics to get more bookings, sell more products, and attract more clients. If you're looking to increase your direct response sales, create a big time personal brand, and become the go to guru, the Speaking of Wealth Show is for you. Here is your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to the Speaking of Wealth Show. This is your host, Jason Hartman, where we discuss profit strategies for speakers, publishers, authors, consultants, coaches, info marketers, and just go over a whole bunch of exciting things that you can use to increase your business, to make your business more successful and more and more passive and more and more automated and more and more scalable. So we will be back with a great interview. Be sure to visit us at speakingofwealth.com. You can take advantage of our blog, subscribe subscribe to the RSS feed and many other resources for free at speakingofwealth.com. And we will be back with a great interview for you in less than 60 seconds. Now you can get Jason's Creating Wealth in Today's Economy Home Study Course. All the knowledge and education revealed in a nine-hour day of the Creating Wealth Boot Camp, created in a home study course for you to dive into at your convenience. For more details, go to jasonhartman.com My pleasure to welcome David Murray to the show. He is the director of social media for Moncur Associates in Troy, Michigan. He was a speaker at Blog World when I attended it in New York City, and he's going to talk today about 10 steps to build your business through content. David, welcome. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you very much for having me. Well, it's my pleasure. So, your presentation at Blog World was about those 10 steps. Tell us about them if you would, and then after that, I'd like to touch on Google Plus and Pinterest a little bit, since sure. those are the hot, newer things that are dominating a lot of the social media world right now. But what are the 10 steps? Uh, the 10 steps. Well, uh, like I broke out at Blog World in New York, I actually started with step point five, which was identify your business goals. Before anyone jumps on the social web and starts creating content, the first thing that they need to do is think about, you know, what am I doing as a business? What are my goals and what are my marketing objectives? Because when it comes to your content, the content is actually an extension of your company, and you want to make sure that both your content and your marketing objectives are in line. So make sure that your business goals are in line as well. And then the next step is probably the most important thing, I would say, before anyone decides that they need a Facebook page, and that's to listen. One of the best things about the social web is that it allows businesses to really take advantage and listen to their competition. They can listen to their industry voice, i.e. brand, and actually listen to what consumers are saying or maybe not saying about their particular products or similar products. Following that, you want to make sure that you're able to identify your content bubble, and that's why we suggest listening, because listening helps our clients understand what type of content they want to create. And this content actually filters through the next step, which is number three, which is filtering your subjects into types of content. Do I need more educational content? Do I need more fun content? Do I need curated content, content from other sources? You know, those are important questions to ask yourself. Good questions for sure. So, you know, when we talk about content, I think a lot of businesses out there, you know, of course the group, our audience, they're pretty into content on the Speaking of Wealth show, but, you know, a lot of just traditional businesses out there might believe that they don't really have content. They don't have much to talk about. Just speak to that for a moment, if you will, because I'm sure some speakers, authors, publishers even broach that kind of writer's block problem occasionally. Yeah, you know, it actually goes back to the first step about listening. As we've discovered, when clients listen on the social web and they begin to see not only what their competition, but perhaps similar brands are doing, the type of content that they're sharing, they get an understanding of, one, the type of content that they would like, like to read or engage with as a consumer. So it, it helps them, what I like to say, is the light bulb situation where they like to, the light bulb goes on and they're like, you know what, we should be talking about subject A, B, and C. We don't need to talk about D, E, and F. And we should really be making more videos because our competition isn't doing any videos and people are asking for helpful videos. So the listening really helps break down that writer's block and then going through the practice of identifying a content bubble helps a client understand what type of subjects they should be talking about. And what it ultimately does is 
ultimately it helps the client become a helpful resource of information and not just a source of their own information because people like resources, and most importantly, they like to share resources. Okay, and did you cover all the steps yet? Uh, I think we got to number four, but number four was kind of in line with what I was just talking about, which is cultivate your botanical garden. Make sure that um, your social networks look good, your uh, content looks good. And number five is in line with that. Identify the social networks that you can manage. We're all busy, and content, I will tell you, takes a lot of time to do it well. And that's when a lot of people get in trouble. They jump on all the social networks and they realize they don't have time to do it and they become ghost towns. So, you know, identifying the social networks that you can manage is probably the, one of the most important steps. Do you, do you recommend any of the tools for that that take the same content and syndicate it over different social networks? For example, like TweetDeck, you know, and I, I don't use these tools myself, but right. I've heard about them where you can post, you can tweet, you can post on Facebook. I'm not sure if it works with Google Plus or not, but you can, you can kind of go one place and then syndicate the same content to all the places. You know, actually, we're probably one of the few agencies that doesn't recommend auto-populating your content. Now, granted, if you're just a one-person shop, you don't have the luxury of time, and it's okay to do that occasionally. But what you want to do, going back to cultivate your botanical garden, is make sure that people have a reason to go to all your social networks. If you're just blasting the content across multiple channels, it's not doing very good. You know, there are tools that can do that. TweetDeck, as you mentioned, is one. Hootsuite. We use a content um, management tool called Awareness Hub, which can create content. You can create the content in it, and it will ask you where do you want to put this and when. So that's a helpful tool. Uh, what we like to do uh, is actually we like to stagger content for our clients if they need that auto population. And by that I mean maybe we do the blog post goes live on the website. And then a day later, we tweet it, and then a couple of days later, it's on a Facebook page. So it isn't blasted all at the same time. Right, right. But, you know, in, in fairness to the people who do use those things, and I don't, it's maybe a different audience on each network anyway. So right. it's not the end of the world to use that. No, it, it, won't, it definitely won't cripple you, but I would strongly suggest to be as human as possible when it comes to social media. Right. Okay. What else? Uh, let's see. I think we got to step six, which is organize your efforts. You know, you want to have a content calendar. Uh, we make sure that this is part of our client's social media strategy, and our calendars aren't necessarily assigned specifics per se, meaning on the month of June, you have to blog on this day, and then on this day, you have to tweet. You know, we kind of break it up so it's manageable and digestible. We say, in this month, you have four blog posts due, and you have 15 posts that can be divided between Facebook and Twitter, and we break it up weekly so the client can see very streamlined what they need to get done. The seventh step we actually talked about, which was build unique value for your social networks. Like I said, give people a reason why they need to follow you. And probably number eight is another important one, provide a call to action. It's great to have all this content, but if you're not telling people what to do, especially if you have a service or product that you're trying to ultimately sell or get in the hands of people, believe it or not, but people are not going to automatically assume where to go when it comes to that. So let them know where they can go to find out more about you and what you do. Number nine in line with that, I would say make it easy for people to accomplish your calls to action. I don't know about you, but I'm not a big fan of filling out 36 fields of information when I want to sign up for an email newsletter. How about you? I couldn't agree more. You know, <laughs> let, me, let me tell you something. My first book that I published back like 12 years ago now was called Become the Brand of Choice. And it was about relationship marketing and personal branding. And one of the things I said in there, and this was way before the age of really a lot of the internet stuff, and of course before the age of social media, I said, make it easy to do business with you. It is amazing to me how, how some businesses, they just don't want your money. <laughs> I mean, right. as, as a customer, it is one of my total pet peeves. I want to give a business my money. I want to hire them. I want to buy their product. And they make it difficult. One of the, the, one of the reasons for the success of companies like Amazon.com is it's just so easy to buy from them. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you nailed it around the head. As a customer, I want to, make it, I want to buy from you. So 
I think what businesses need to do a little bit more is think like a customer when it comes to not only their content, but how they communicate online. You just said you don't like going through all these steps, so why in the world would you create all those steps for your customers thinking that it's different for you? Absolutely, absolutely. One of, one of the things I'm always telling my staff is that whenever you do something, say it's on one of our websites, I want you to go and act just like a customer, not through the back end, not with your password, not with your admin login. You go and act just just like a customer and go have the customer experience right. and see how it works for them. And of course, I beat that drum all the time, but getting people to do it is quite another matter. They don't yeah. always do it. But uh, yeah, no, no question about it. Yeah. Well, hey, I want to kind of switch gears here if we could, sure. uh, unless there's anything else you want to mention on that topic before we switch gears. Um, yeah, just the last thing I would say is just make sure you're measuring and reviewing your progress. Make sure that you're hitting all your KPIs, which is key performance indicators, because that will lead you to the big question, what's my ROI, return on investment, with all this stuff. So, Well, actually, actually, before we switch gears then, give us an example of KPI, of key performance sure. indicator. Like, like what would someone be looking at in the social web that would be a good KPI? Yeah, absolutely. Now, this is actually why I mentioned step 0.5, because what you measure very ultimately, not very ultimately, is it connected to your overall marketing objectives? And is that brand awareness? If you're a nonprofit, are you trying to get you know more referrals to your website and get people to sign up for your newsletter? You know, is it customer retention? Is it cost per customer? Is it sales? So depending upon what your overall objective is, is really going to focus on the types of KPI that you should be uh, monitoring. Now let's just say, for example, um, the identified objective is brand awareness. You're a new company, you're a new product, you have a new service, and you need to get it out there. So before you can expect all the cash registers to go crazy, people need to know about who you are. So when it comes to brand awareness, community growth, you know, we don't like to talk about the numbers that much, but it does play. So you want to make sure that a KPI is that the community is growing. Uh, you want to see engagement, and by engagement, I'm meaning people are actually clicking on your content, they're commenting, they're sharing it, they're liking it, they're retweeting it, and how frequently are they doing that, and how often per month? So just to give you a really high-level example, those are some of the KPIs related to brand awareness. And just quickly, let's touch on, before you go, let's touch on Pinterest and Google+. Plus. Those are, sure. the, those are the, the newer kids in town, <laughs> and you know, they're both big, of course. Which one do you want to take first? Um, we can talk about Google+. Plus. Yeah, Google+, Plus, um, you know, it's kind of getting a lot of, a lot of uh, word of mouth because of all the search algorithms and how Google is uh, changing that, and Google Plus is going to play a big part. You know, again, I would never recommend anyone jump on a tool just for the sake of it because it's new and it's the next big thing. The search results that we've seen for our clients as it relates to Google Plus, um, though they have increased, it's nothing that I would say change the books, change the entire game plan, forget Facebook, you need to get on Google Plus right now. I think the jury is still out, and with us, that's the same thing. We're not 110% convinced that it's going to be the biggest social network and it's going to change everything, but we're definitely seeing some changes within it. So all those steps that I mentioned, if you go through those 10 steps, you'll be able to understand if you need to be on Google Plus or not. You want me to jump to Pinterest? Yep, or? jump to Pinterest, and then we got to go. Cool. You know, Pinterest is great when it comes to consumer brands. The People are talking about how social media is becoming image-heavy. Uh, we always felt that the social web was always very image-friendly, but now it's even more so. So if you have a brand that's very visually interesting, that's a place to go. Obviously, the majority of demographics on Pinterest are females. And I read somewhere that like 40%, I, can't, I don't know if that's the correct number, but something around like 40% of the people who are on Pinterest when they engage with a brand will make a purchase while they're on Pinterest. So that's pretty cool. Amazing, amazing. So with Pinterest, is that really uh, something that it's more applicable to big brands and small businesses shouldn't spend a lot of time on Pinterest, maybe have a presence, but not, not make it a big, big time consumer? Yeah, you know, you know, without knowing what a particular business would be, I would never suggest do it, right. do not do it. But you know, if your brand leads towards some visual aspects, if there's something that really would drive it to be part of Pinterest community, I would recommend it. You know, we have 2.5 seconds to grab people's attention, so if that is going to be a way to do it, because through your visual content, then by all means, you might want to 
invest some time. But again, let's go back to step number one and listen. Are your, some of your competitors are similar brands on Pinterest, and what are they doing, and what aren't they doing? Good points. Well, David, give out your website, if you would, and tell people where they can learn more. Sure, absolutely. Uh, you can find us at monkerassociates.com. Our blog is davidmonker.com. My personal blog is themer.com. And uh, will there be an opportunity to share the slides on this podcast or a link uh, in it? Yeah, comment? well, you, you have them on SlideShare. So do you have a link you want to give out, or is it linked from your website? Yeah, you can find our presentation at slideshare.net backslash thinkmonkor. Excellent. Well, David Murray, thank you so much for joining us today. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Jason. Here's your chance to catch up on all of those Creating Wealth shows that you've missed. There's a three-book set with shows 1 through 60, all digital download. You save $94 by buying this three-book set. Go ahead and get these advanced strategies for wealth creation. For more details, go to jasonhartman.com. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc. exclusively.